Good morning, friends. On behalf of the School of Engineering and Technology, Indira Gandhi National Open University, I, Rakesh Sharma, Program Coordinator, ACPDM, welcome you all in this interactive teleconferencing program of Advanced Certificate in Power Distribution Management. Friends, you are aware that we conduct teleconferencing sessions on the various topics related to, to, related to the, your course, the power distribution, and for this, we invite the experts from their respective fields. Now, let me take this opportunity to introduce our today's expert. We have Dr. Arun Kanda. We welcome you in this session, sir. Thank you. Dr. Arun Kanda is the professor in mechanical engineering at IIT Delhi. Professor Kanda's main interest in project management, operation management, and OR. He has over 30 years teaching and research experience. And in today's session, he is talking about the project identification and appraisal in the first session. And in the second session, he will discuss about the project implementation. So friends, this is the interactive session. If you have any query, you can ask at any time during the presentation. Our toll-free number is 1-800-12345. Now I would request Professor Kandas to take up his presentation. Thank you, Raki. Thank you very much for introducing me. And good morning, friends. As Raki just mentioned, I'll be sharing with you two sessions. The first session today is going to be on project identification and screening, which is the uh, which constitutes the major uh, block in your uh, part of this particular uh, uh, examination and then the second part of my presentation is going to be devoted to project execution so let us begin the talk let me first formally identify the title of the first talk it's going to be something on project identification and screening as you all know that uh, we should begin with the notion of a project what is a project? A project is essentially an entity or a set of tasks which are performed to accomplish some objective. So when you talk about the motivation of the project, we can say that the motivation of all projects is to accomplish some objectives. These objectives may be either individual or family objectives. They could be organizational objectives or they could be national or global objectives. And basically, the need for doing a project arises because you must respond to these objectives. So this is how a project takes birth. So a project takes birth in response to a specific need or a specific objective. And once we are clear about the need, then only we can identify projects and then only we can appraise projects and implement projects. So as they say, necessity is the mother of invention. Similarly, project identification begins in response to the specific need or the specific objectives. It is worthwhile to note how projects ultimately develop and what are the stages they pass through. The first thing that one has to do after the need has been identified is to find out, is to identify the projects. Now there could be a number of alternative projects which satisfy the same need. So you have to appraise the projects. That means you have to find out which particular out of the many alternative projects that you have identified could be worthwhile. This could be quite a challenging task. And this is exactly the subject matter of today's lecture. And then once you have done the detailed appraisal, you do project selection. That means out of the various product projects that you have identified, you try to find out or select which is the best one. So basically, the process of project selection boils down to identifying, appraising, and finally choosing a best project. And this project selection, ultimately, the collection of all these activities is generally called a detailed project report. So essentially speaking, we are talking about the preparation 
of a detailed project report for a project so that the project can be evaluated and appreciated in the right context. So that is like playing the major objectives of the project. Now let us uh, look at these three distinct phases of project appraisal in a little more detail. You see what happens is we just said that uh, project identification begins with the objectives. So you identify your objectives. Once you have identified the objectives, you need to essentially identify what are your own strengths and weaknesses. That means you have to look at either the individual or the organization's strengths and weaknesses. And in the process of doing that, you must look at the organization as a whole so that you must ensure that whether the project that you have identified you can undertake or not. And not only is it essential to assess your own strengths and weaknesses, it is also essential to identify the threats and opportunities which exist in the environment. Uh, to put it in a slightly uh, jocular sense, I would simply say that identification of strengths and weaknesses is like identifying your internal, looking internally and trying to find out what your strengths and weaknesses are as an individual, as an organization. So it's very much like opening and closing of your eyes to assess your self. And once you have done that, then you have got to find out what are the threats and opportunities which generally come from the environment. And these environmental variables could typically be things like which are the strategic competitors, what are the threats that you have, who could topple you down and things of that kind. So it is like identifying all those. So what we are trying to basically assess is that in identifying the right kind of projects, you must be able to assess your own strengths, your weaknesses, and also identify your threats and opportunities. So these are basically internal strengths and external in the sense of uh, opportunities that exist. And on the basis of this, you can identify alternative project possibilities. So this is the mechanism or the crux of identifying the right kind of projects. Now let us see how we can go about this. This exercise is generally done in an organization or even at an individual level. You see, you can identify individual projects for growth. Huh? For instance, any young student who passes his 12th class is faced with the problem of trying to choose a career. So he has to decide a project, whether he should go in for a commerce career, whether he should go in for an engineering career, whether he should do some vocational studies and so on. Those are major decisions which are actually something like personal projects. And in order to find the right answer, each one takes a decision based on internal brainstorming. Similarly, if a decision on the choice of a project has to be taken by a company, it has to be done on the basis of brainstorming by the individuals concerned, those individuals who matter. So brainstorming is a good means to generate new project ideas. You know what brainstorming is. Everyone sits down in a meeting and then you discuss the ideas threadbare and then you try to identify what could be the possible alternatives for dealing with the problem at hand. The f there is a focus on uninhibited participation by a group. Listing of ideas is generally done without suppressing creativity at source. I think this is a very important part of brainstorming. While doing brainstorming, we don't criticize anybody's ideas. We simply jot them down. Why? Because we don't want to, we don't want to suppress or we don't want to uh, crush any individual's ideas or points of view just before they take shape. 
So listing of ideas without suppressing creativity at source and the list of ideas is subsequent to screening and evaluation subsequently. It's very much like saying a child they say is a most innocent and creative person. When a child sees a lizard walking on the roof or the ceiling of your company, he might come up to his dad and say, why does that lizard walk on the roof? Can't I walk? Now the father might say, oh it's a foolish idea, have you ever seen men? But no, he's talking about totally new technologies which might enable you to walk like robots on any particular thing, on the surface of the moon or anything. So what we are trying to say is that encourage creativity and encouragement of creativity is generally done during brainstorming. You are not criticizing the idea, later on you can criticize it, you can evaluate it. Now when you have identified projects or alternatives, then they are subjected to a screening and the screening could be done on many familiar criteria. Some of the familiar criteria are investment, how many lakhs does it take to invest in project A vis-a-vis -vis project B, what is the rate of return, what is the risk, what is the likely profit, what is the payback, what is the similarity of this business to the existing business, what is the expected life, what is the flexibility of this business, what is the environmental impact and what is the extent of competition. These and similar questions can be asked and the criteria for screening projects can be different. It's very much like uh, it's a subjective and an objective evaluation. That is what we must remember. You know, again, you take very many important decisions in life. Many of those decisions are subjective in character. Choosing a job, for instance, is dependent not only on the pay, but also on the prospects for living. Choosing a spouse to live with is both a subjective and an objective decision. So some of the most decisions in life are subjective and objective and we have to use both criteria in evaluating these decisions. Similarly, this applies in project management. Now let's take an example to clarify these concepts. Let us say that our objective is for purposes of illustration to reduce vehicular pollution in Delhi, right? I mean, when you are designing a city, you are all uh, construction engineers, you want to design new cities and you want to design them in such a manner that the cities are environment friendly, they, you are able to live uh, in a peaceful manner, people are at harmony and peace with each other. So considering that general need and necessity, you want to design a city and in that context, suppose our objective is to reduce vehicular pollution in Delhi. So this is an objective. Now considering this objective in mind, let us try to identify what projects could be done. And then out of those projects, we'll try to do project identification, then a project appraisal and subsequently a project selection just for illustrative purposes. So I'll use this as an example to talk about some of the key concepts in project identification and appraisal in this particular session. So through a brainstorming session, when I did this uh, exercise in my class, uh, students came up with a number of ideas. I'm sure you can all come up with new ideas. But here are some of the ideas that they came up with. The, you know, Delhi has a large number of uh, vehicles. There's a lot of pollution in Delhi as a consequence of the vehicles. And we are interested in reducing vehicular pollution. So some of the projects or ideas that came up through brainstorming were, number one, restrict registration of new vehicles. This would be a good idea because it is read that the total number of cars coming on the street every day I don't know how much it is now, but it's over, well over a thousand cars, new cars coming on the scene. So if we could restrict the registration of new vehicles every day, this would, uh, to some extent, help in curbing pollution. So this was thought that this could be an idea. Obviously, this idea has its pros and cons. What are the pros and cons of this idea? 
I mean, just look at this project as a whole. The pros would be that the people who are intending to buy new cars, they would not like this idea. And similarly, those people who, uh, and moreover, it might be a little, it might meet with certain resistance from the manufacturers of cars, because they would not like to cut down on their profits by restricting sales. So the important thing to understand here is that each project uh, situation or project proposal impinges on a certain category of society in terms of its impact and it may or may not therefore be a worthwhile idea but we have listed it as one of the possibilities right what are the other things that could be done to reduce vehicular pollution the second project is and for strict emission regulations for vehicles. Now this is understandable that uh, you have these pollution checking centers, let them become very strict and uh, make sure that uh, no uh, car or no polluting vehicle, three wheeler or two wheelers are passed with the pollutants. So you are becoming very strict on uh, emission regulations. Maybe you stick to the next Euro norms and ensure that your cars are roadworthy in that sense of the term and do that. This could be done even by imposing better technology and things of that kind. But this is again a project in the sense that if the government can ensure this and it becomes a project. A third project could be ban diesel run, diesel run vehicles on road. Now it's a well known fact that diesel produces more pollutants than petrol or CNG. So if you ban diesel run vehicles on road, it is expected that the total amount of pollutants in the city will go down. So this could be another project. You could introduce a mass rapid transportation system for the city. In fact, this has already been done. The metro is under construction and that is the mass rapid transportation system for the city and that is a major project. And it, is, it remains to be seen whether it will solve the vehicular pollution problem or not, and whether it will solve the traffic congestion problem or not. But at the moment, we are all facing the problems of diversion of traffics and this and that as far as this particular project is concerned. The next project could be encourage use of carpools. See, carpool means a very simple thing. Suppose four people from a colony have to go to Vigyan Bhavan for every day and each one carries his car. Why not uh, do it every day like on Monday I will carry my car and pick up all the four. On Tuesday somebody else picks up all the cars. So all that is required is a bit of coordination among colleagues so that they instead of four vehicles on the road there is only one vehicle on the road every day. So if you encourage the use of carpools this could be a good project to reduce vehicular pollution. But again, this is not done generally. Why is it not done? Let's think. There are ego problems to some extent. If I have to go and park my car outside somebody's house and the fellow is taking his breakfast and if he takes two minutes more, I feel that he's wasting my time. Whereas I might waste 20 minutes more in having a cup of coffee at my office. So we are not broad-minded enough or we don't, we lack the system's vision to basically, you see, every uh, project will require some penalties, will have some costs and some rewards. And we have to systematically evaluate the rewards and penalties. That is what project evaluation is all about. Another option could be grow more trees and green belts in the city. This will reduce the vehicular pollution because as you know, plants contribute to better environment. The seventh project that was identified was declaring no traffic zones in the city. This also has been partially implemented in the city. You know, if you go around Connaught Place these days, they don't let you park your car. You have to park it uh, maybe uh, one or two miles away and walk in that Rajiv Chowk and things like that. That means they have identified certain areas where you don't have... Uh, 
no traffic, where you don't have any traffic, and then you park your cars and walk in that city. So many cities all over the world are following this concept of declaring no traffic zones. So if these are systematically done, this would be a project in itself. And the project number eight that was identified was ban vehicles with an age of 10 or more years from plying on the road. Jitna purana ho jata hai vehicle. The older the vehicle, the more pollutants it generally tends to generate. And as a consequence, it is desired that uh, projects should in fact have uh, sh old, very old uh, cars and three-wheelers, etc. should not have a higher age. So this was it. Now, the point that I am trying to stress here is, look at the example. The example was, what was our objective? Yes, our objective was to reduce vehicular pollution in the city. For identifying that objective, we have, through brainstorming, identified eight possible projects. Now, these eight projects could be good projects or bad projects. So these eight project ideas need, we have done, what have we done so far? We have done project identification. So the first step in the project selection stage we have done, that is identified these eight projects. Now we would like to subject these projects to a screening to find out which one is good and how good it is relatively. That is the next stage of project screening. And this could be done, in fact you could generate more ideas which could be generated through a brainstorming exercise. And I would like to mention here that the example of vehicular pollution that I chose was only for illustrative purposes. To give you an idea that for any project scenario in the construction industry, in uh, cement industry, anywhere you will have to generate these project ideas and then evaluate them. So it is more in the sense of a systems understanding that you should develop an idea for what we mean by different kinds of projects. Now let us look at the screening. How are we going to screen these ideas? We will continue with this example. Now I feel that four criteria are needed for screening. And the four criteria that we consider are worthwhile are these following. Effectiveness to achieve objective. This must be a good criterion. That means you must find out whether the proposal that you have suggested is good enough to achieve the objective. Nahito, you started with a proposal, you have done something else, and that something else should achieve the objective, otherwise not. Otherwise it remains a slogan. Isn't it? For instance, we have had a slogan to remove poverty, to remove illiteracy in the country, and hundreds of projects have been initiated. But have they really led to the accomplishment of the objective? That is something that needs to be seen. And therefore, linking of the project with the supposed objective is very, very necessary. So the effectiveness to achieve objective, you have to measure whether this project will be able to achieve the objective. That is one of the criteria. Second is cost of the proposal. I may achieve to kar sakta. I can achieve this proposal. But what will be going to be the cost? Is it a prohibitive cost or can I really implement the proposal? That is important. Third thing is ease of implementation. Is it possible for me to implement the proposal? I mean, can it be done easily or is it difficult? And what is the time needed? If a project takes too much time, matlab, meri zindagi ho in that process, then of course, my zindagi means the organization's life cycle might be over by that time. Then it's not a worthwhile proposal. So all these four things are crucial. That is, effectiveness of the proposal, the cost of the proposal, the ease with which it can be implemented, and the time needed. Essentially, what we have to do is, we have to find out whether each of those projects that we have uh, identified are actually how they are performing on these fronts. And on this basis, we should then be able to assess the various projects. So that is what I am going to do. 
So this is an illustrative list again and the criteria could be added if needed. Now just to evaluate these eight project proposals on this scale, it's a subjective scale. So I will evaluate each project idea on a scale of 0 to 5. And I will say for instance effectiveness, if it is low, effectiveness means effectiveness to achieve the goal. Our goal in the project is to reduce vehicular pollution. If it is low, I will give it 0 marks. If it is high, I will give it 5 marks and a scale from very poor, poor, fair, average, good and excellent. And my assessment will be essentially subjective or I will talk to expert groups who are dealing with similar types of projects. Similarly, the cost. If it is high, it is undesirable. If it is low, the cost is desirable. This is high and low refers to the options that you have available. Implementation, if it is difficult, you give low marks. If it is easy, you give high marks. If the time required is maximum, then it is unfriendly, that is very poor. The time, that project which takes the minimum time for implementation is excellent. So we have built in the concept of a subjective scale on the basis of which we can assess each project on these various criteria. So based on this scale, we can then evaluate these projects. For instance, we can say that uh, the various projects, for instance, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, that is project number 5, for instance, is encourage use of carpools, got a score of 2, 5, 4, 4 by an expert group. It means that the first criterion uh, that was effectiveness, it was rated as number 2. The second criterion it was rated as, which is cost of implementation, it was high, high in the sense it's very easy to implement, that's why it got 5 marks on a 5 point scale. Implementation, relatively easy, so 4 marks and time, 4 marks. So if we do this, now somebody might say that this is a subjective evaluation. Yes, it is a subjective evaluation, but some kind of subjective evaluation is better than no evaluation. It's very difficult to evaluate projects otherwise. But at the moment, we are not doing a detailed appraisal of the project. We are only evaluating what is called screening of the projects. <coughs> so if you sum up these weights, the total score given to this uh, project number 5 is the sum of these two, 5 plus 2, 7 plus 4, uh, 11 plus 4, 15. And similarly, the scores for each of the projects, 5, 6, 7 and 8, 1 to 8, these are obtained. And what I can do is, on this basis, I can find out the first, second and third. That means it's like saying that in a class of 10 boys, who are the ones who are standing first, second and third? So I have identified, in this case, out of the various projects, project number 2, which is enforce strict emissions regulations on vehicles got 18 points. Project number 5, encourage use of carpools got 15 points and grow more trees or green belts in the city got 13 points and the other projects were far behind. So out of the list of 8 projects, I have a mechanism by means of which I have been able to identify the 3 best projects. This is how identification can be done systematically. That means, let us now recapitulate what we have done. We have identified a mechanism of brainstorming to first identify projects according to a certain need. Having prepared this list of projects, we evaluate each of these projects on the basis of their effectiveness, cost, implementation and usage as I illustrated on the basis of that example. And on the basis of that example, we saw that we have a means of identifying the top best or the top one or two best projects that can be done. Now, out of the eight projects that we have got, we have got these three. Now you should go in for a detailed appraisal of these factors, these projects, and see whether they are worthwhile. It's like saying when you are selecting candidates, First you call for general applications, you do the screening. 
once the screening has been done then you call candidates for a detailed interview or a test so once these this screening of projects has been done we will now subject each of these project proposals to a detailed appraisal before deciding which project is to be done in much the same spirit as we do while collecting candidates for an organization so we have i have illustrated to you this phase the first phase of project identification now let us now go to project appraisal and subsequently to project selection now what is project appraisal once we have identified in this case out of eight three projects which are now candidate project proposals we have to carry out a detailed project appraisal a detailed project appraisal consists of essentially these five elements it consists of a market appraisal a technical appraisal a financial appraisal a socio economic appraisal and an ecological appraisal and once this appraisal is done all these appraisals are done this entire document forms what is called a detailed project report so what is a detailed project report a detailed project report is a compilation of these five project appraisals which are done on a single project and as a consequence you can do these individual appraisals now let us see what is meant by each of these appraisals each appraisal could be a detailed appraisal a market appraisal is something like this a market appraisal means that in the beginning time now the smaller circle represents the sales and the sector represents my market share 5 years from now the market share might be the bigger circle but my market share might be the sector which is shown there so basically what i have to do over these 5 years is to estimate how the market grows from the smaller circle to the bigger circle in 5 years and what is going to be my market share because it is on this bit of information is going to be based all my estimates of costs and revenues and the cash flows are going to be based essentially on this information so this is the crux of the problem estimation of or forecasting the demand of your product or service over the next 5 or 10 years in terms of the overall growth and your market share this in the issue the other issues involved in a market appraisal of a project are you need the past and current demand trends now in order to forecast the future trend you need the past and current trend so that you can extrapolate them and you need the past and current supply positions so you have past and current demand trends and past and current supply position and based on this you try to forecast so there are a variety of uh, time series and other models forecasting models available which will help you do this but you must understand the problem is that you must this must be supported by appropriate data of this nature then you must be able to identify production possibilities and constraints that mean there could be new technologies coming new production possibilities coming new methods of imports and exports the competition nature might change the cost structure might be different the elasticity of demand all these factors could influence the manner in which the demand is going to grow and you are trying to predict the future demand future is always uncertain you don't know what's going to happen but in order to write a detailed project report for the market you got to make some forecasts and make some assumptions so that is based on these kinds of considerations other issues involved in market appraisal are consumer behavior what are their motivations and attitudes preferences and requirements these are very important see a couple of years ago before the cell phone came on the scene nobody had even heard of a cell phone everybody was wiring using the dial tones and other things but suddenly one new technological invention and every van on the street 
even a plumber has a cell phone in his pocket. So what has happened? The motivations, the attitudes, the preferences and the requirements have changed suddenly based on just the availability of a new technology. So you can understand how dynamic and complex this problem of forecasting the demand for cell phones in the next couple of years is likely to be. Because if you foresee a totally new technological innovation which is much superior to the cell phone, who says the cell phone might be out of date and somebody might be using very sophisticated iPods which are just something of uh, the nature of a chip or something of that kind. So consumer behavior is a very important point in market appraisal. So the point that I am trying to make is that market appraisal is not an easy thing. It requires a total understanding of the market and it also requires that you uh, project in terms of how things are growing and only on that basis can you do a proper market survey. Then similar things apply to distribution channels, your marketing policies, the administrative, technical and legal constraints and so on. So that is what we have talked about a market appraisal. So market appraisal, essentially these components. Then a technical appraisal. What is a technical appraisal? Technical appraisal deals primarily with these two questions. Whether the prerequisites for the success of the project have been considered. That means technically sound proposal hai ke nahi hai. What does technical soundness mean? that you should not have made a proposal in which you violate any law of physics or law of chemistry and you might have made a stupid proposal in calculating something else. Right? That can happen. So that means checking all the processes, checking the inputs and outputs as per existing laws. That is technical appraisal. And then you make good choices with regard to location, size, process, machines, etc. Have you chosen the right size of machines? Have you chosen the proper break-even points? Are you choosing, choosing a batch process or a mass production process or a job production process and so on, depending on the size that you are dealing with? All these issues come under a technical appraisal. Obviously, this is a specialist job for each project. Then an economic appraisal. How is an economic appraisal different from a financial appraisal? An economic appraisal talks about social cost benefit analysis. Normally projects which are big and funded by government and funded for government and for large number of populations, the direct economic benefits and costs in terms of shadow prices have to be taken into consideration. What that eventually means is what is going to be the impact of the project on distribution of income in society. You know the building, I give you an example, the building of the, that uh, Narmada Dam project for instance has been uh, obstructed to a very large extent by social protests by a section of the community because it is displacing a large number of people from their livelihoods. That's a social cost. It's a cost in which uh, by undertaking a project, the government is paying a social penalty by the displacement of people. It's not a direct cost in that sense. But such costs also have to be taken into consideration. So when you do a project or when you are widening a road and you are displacing so many people, that's a social cost as well. Of course, you have to pay compensation. So you measure that cost in terms of some penalties. So this is the kind of social aspect of projects. And you got to, when you are doing large projects, this becomes relevant. I mean, you know, we were talking about the pipeline from uh, Iran. Now, that project got delayed for political reasons. The pipeline has to pass through another country, through a neighboring country. And you want to find out whether the it will be allowed or whether it should be under the sea and so on. Now, those international projects also have their own implications. So essentially, when you're doing an economic appraisal, you're talking about the impact of the project on the distribution of income in society, the impact on level of savings and the investments in the society. An ecological appraisal 
talks about impact of the project on air, water, noise, vegetation, human life. Obviously, this is becoming more and more important. With ISO 9000, the effect of the project on the environment is becoming more and more important. The financial appraisal of a project, finally, is generally the most important appraisal. It consists of two things. Number one, if you normally, most projects, you take loans from banks. Whether the project has a capability of servicing the debt, that's the first thing. And then, does it have the capability of meeting your return expectations? Return expectations means what is the level of profit that you will get from the project. So, most uh, businessmen are interested in projects primarily for this reason. And there could be many financial indicators which determine how good the project is. Some of them are listed here. The net present value the internal rate of return, the simple before and after tax rates of return, the equivalent annual cost, the payback period, the discounted payback period. I see from your lecture notes that many methods for calculating many of these are available. So I'm not going to go into details, nor do we have the time to talk in detail about these things. But the point to understand here is that these are all measures available to find out the financial worthwhileness of a project. It's like saying that if you want to calculate whether a project is worthwhile financially, you can calculate its NPV or IRR or rate of return, etc. Here is a small project which has an initial investment of 3 lakhs, annual cost of operation, let us say, of 20,000. Just to illustrate what we mean, so the expected annual revenues for this project will be 1 lakh per annum for the first two years, let us say, and 2 lakhs per annum for the next three years. Normally, you would expect lower profits in the first few years because you are recovering costs. And in the next few years, you will expect higher. So that is what is assumed. And let us assume a planning horizon of five years. So by spending 3 lakhs now, your annual cost is 20,000 rupees. You are expected to get annual revenues of 1 lakh for the first 2 years and 2 lakhs. What will the stream of cash flows look like? It will be something like this. You can always note down the revenues. 100, 100, 200, 200, 200 in terms of thousands of rupees. Costs right now are 300,000. Right now, you have to spend that much money and the profits you get are 20, 20, 20, 20 and the time in years. So this becomes what is called the gross cash flow. And uh, from the gross cash flow, you can write it down like this, minus 380, 80, 180, 180, 180. What it means is that by spending 3 lakhs of rupees right now, I am getting a net profit of 80,000, 80,000 in the first and the second year and a net profit of 180,000 in the third, fourth and fifth year. So this statement is the statement of gross cash flows here. This is the basic information you would need to do a cash flow analysis or a financial analysis of the project. Then you can uh, calculate the internal rate of return, which in this case is the rate of return for which the NPV is equal to zero and the internal rate of return for this project works out to about 30% as you can see here. And uh, similarly, the payback for this project would be dependent upon to a very large extent on uh, the rate of interest that you choose. So at 0% rate of interest, the payback is 2.78. That means the project pays for itself in 2.78 years. If you increase the rate of interest to 10%, the project pays for itself in 3.21 years. So the payback gives you an idea of how much time the project takes to pay back for itself. A lower payback period would be more valuable. So this is the essential concept. Similar calculations can be done for the net cash flows rather than the gross cash flows like we are doing it here. And finally, you can compare both the before tax and the after tax returns for different rates of interest. And the comparison would be different. The point that I'm simply making here is that the NPV, the payback, and the before and after tax cash flows would, in fact, vary depending upon these various things. Now, I think uh, this gives you an idea of what exactly a financial 
uh, evaluation of the project would be. So some of the key issues involved in project analysis are we do a market analysis, we do a technical analysis, we do a financial analysis where we calculate the risk and return, we do an economic analysis, we do an ecological analysis and the combination of all these goes into a detailed project report. Now that could be a heavy document, 350 pages or so on each project which will compare all these various things. So the preparation, it's something that can be summarized like this, that we have an idea generation which gives us screening. After the screening, we do project appraisal, project appraisal and finally based on the project appraisal, we do project selection. So thank you, Professor Kanda. We have the short time. So Professor Kanda has focused on the various aspects of the project identification and uh, appraisal. So friends, we will again be in discussion after 15 minutes. Thank you.